Today we're going to check out the Xvico Pioneer. The Pioneer is a Cartesian i3 style 3D printer from Xvico, a Far East company in China. It has a 220 by 220 by 240 millimeter build volume. It has a removable non-heated print bed, a Bowden style extruder setup, a 2.4 inch color touchscreen, power off resume, and a few other features you might find handy. Now this is a very common design in the 3D printer market today. But does the Pioneer hold up against some of the other options you have in this range? Well, let's have a look at it, and as usual, I like to start with the things that I like about the 3D printer. We'll start with the most obvious things. The construction on the printer is pretty nice. It's getting to be kind of a classic design at this point, but standard aluminum extrusion, but on this one, it has this nice cover in the front that kind of seals everything in. I like this look, and it has a nice chunky power switch here. I like that as well. And the glass bed is removable. You can just slide it out the front pretty easily if you want to take the parts off that way. I actually never do take it off, but you could if you wanted to. It does have a 32-bit mainboard, which is kind of nice, although I believe it's running some sort of proprietary firmware. But I think the biggest feature that I like about this printer is this touchscreen. It's pretty intuitive and responsive, no issues there. There's not a ton of options available, but it's enough to get you up and printing. If you want to print, you can just go to the SD card menu, and it'll show you all the files and folders that are on the SD card, and all the files if you want to print one. You can just click on your file, it's going to ask you if you'd like to print it, and you can hit OK. The printer also has power off or zoom, so if you lose power, it'll go back to printing where you left off. So you're printing, power goes out, power comes back on. When it boots up, it's going to tell you that you have unfinished task. You can just hit OK to continue. It's going to heat back up. It'll go home. And right back to printing so you don't lose any progress on your mini Joe telling. It also has the beefier style in stop switches. These are good to see. These seem to be a lot more consistent than the smaller ones. It also comes with some wires to add a filament switch if you want to that have been pre-ran with the extruder motor wires. It doesn't have the switch, but you can add one fairly easily with this. There's even a mounting plate for the switch. So the bare bones of this machine are just fine. The frame's good, it has a nice cover on the front, it's got a touch screen and a 32-bit mainboard, but there's a lot of drawbacks to this 3D printer. And the list might seem long, but I want to give you all the information on this machine before you decide to purchase one. And let's get the two biggest things out of the way. There is no heated print surface, so it's pretty much PLA only. And there's no part cooling to speak of. So unless you print really slow with your PLA, and you have your slicer tuned in just perfect, your prints probably aren't going to look that good. And let me show you the part that they added to try to get a bit of part cooling. This duct was screwed onto the hot end fan in the front on the bottom two screws, so it was trying to direct some of the hot end fan onto the part to try to cool it, but it didn't work well at all. If you look real close, you can even see that it melted. So for part cooling, this duct is going to pretty much do nothing. But let's keep going and take a look at some of the other not so nice features on my list. So let's start with the hot end. The hot end cage where it holds the fan, this is pretty typical of what you're going to see with a lot of these 3D printers. You can just take it off with a couple of screws. And the hot end itself, this is a pretty common designed heat sink right here, although the block is pretty interesting. The heater and thermistor go down vertical, and then you have the barrel left sticking out the top. Now most of the time when you see this design, you'll have the PTFE tube all the way down to the nozzle, but not on this one. There's two separate pieces. There's the top that feeds the top of the hot end, and then inside this heat block, you have the nozzle type with the PTFE tube that actually goes down inside it all the way to the tip. And if you've ever had to deal with these, you know how prone to jamming they can be. I've had this printer jam countless times. I even switched this to the Capricorn tube, hoping that the higher heat rating would help, but it still gets jams. On longer prints, this setup is really prone to heat creep as well. So my recommendation if you have a printer like this is swap out this coupler up here with a pass-through so that you can run the Bowden tube that comes from your extruder all the way down to your nozzle, like a Creality style machine. That should work a lot better than this. And while we're on the topic of the extruder, there's nothing really special about this one, but it is all metal, so it's better than a lot of those out there. It seems to have plenty of tension, 
But the Bowden tube is a bit oversized. I would definitely look at swapping this out, even if you didn't do that nozzle mod that I just showed you. And here's a look at the underside of the board. It's a very small board. It has an SMT32 processor, so it is 32-bit. And it does have support for that filament sensor. You can see it here. And a heat bed if you want to add it. It does have replaceable stepper drivers, so you could swap them out for something else if you'd like. They do have trim pots, so you can adjust the voltage, so that's good. It does only support the four motors. And although it can support a heated bed, you get this really tiny power supply that would never be able to power one. And speaking of the power supply, there's no cover that goes under this printer, and right down there is mains voltage. So although unlikely, you could get a hand in there and come into contact with mains voltage, and that is never good. Also, the way it's wired up, it puts the power plug right back here, and that's kind of awkward to get to when it's underneath the printer like that. And back to the front of the printer, you can see the SD card slot. It goes right into the main board. But there is something missing if you haven't noticed it already. I'll give you a second. Yeah, there's no USB port anywhere. You can't talk to the board over serial by default. You'd have to rig something up. So no Octoprint here. And that, to me, is just infuriating. I know a lot of people still like to print from the SD card, but I'm not one of them. I like to be able to add it to my Octoprint farm and forget about it. And out of all the things that I really didn't care for on this machine, the USB port really got to me the most. It seems like that's something every printer should have, and it's really easy to add on. But with all that being said, it's a 3D printer. How does it print? Well, let's just start here. This is the biggest benchy that I could fit successfully onto the build plate. You can see a lot of stringing. Again, no part cooling. You can tune your slicer to get a lot better result but this is what you can expect if you're printing at a relatively fast rate. You can also see a lot of inconsistency down the side of the Benchy. It's not the worst I've ever seen, but it is definitely present. And that's probably because of some inconsistency in the extrusion on the printer or with the rolling wheels. The tension might be able to be adjusted, but this is what you're gonna get right out of the box. My try at the Adelinda, crazy stringing. Print quality is not terrible, but that stringing is hard to get over. This is probably the best print that I've had off this machine, and this is my community catch-up trophy. It's a pretty clean model, but it doesn't have multiple points to go to, so you don't notice the string so much. Again, quality is not terrible. So for a budget 3D printer, it turns out a decent print, and it has some pretty nice features. And with a few added mods, you could make them even better prints and the printer more reliable. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about out-of-the-box experience. And at its price point, just a little bit over $200 US, that puts it even more expensive than its closest competitor. And its competitor's probably gonna have a few more features that you might want on your 3D printer. So competing in this price range, I just don't know how the Pioneer is gonna stand up. So if you're doing a review of a printer that's this style in this price range, you're probably not gonna be able to get through the whole thing without mentioning the Ender 3. The Ender 3 has definitely cornered the market for this type of thing. They have a feature set at a price range that other 3D printer manufacturers probably aren't going to be able to beat. And I have said in the past that I kind of wanted to get out of the Ender 3 market. Not that there's anything wrong with the Ender 3, it's just been done. A lot. But then I got to thinking, this channel's basically just helping other people with their 3D printers. So maybe that's a direction we need to go in. Do more Ender 3 content. And that's definitely something that I'm going to look at in the future. But it's not going to be in this video. This printer was provided by Banggood.com, free of charge for the purpose of this review. No money has exchanged hands, and all opinions expressed are my own. If you liked this video or you found it helpful, please consider giving it a thumbs up or subscribing to my channel. If not, leave your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.